So thank you, Lord, that our songs are a joy in your ear. Our prayers are like incense. They smell sweet to you. And that you delight in them as you delight in us. Just like you fathers in the room delight to see your little ones approach you. And you delight to pick them up and to hold them tight. And you delight in the little nuances of their character. So he delights in us because he's a good father. And so we open ourselves this morning to you, Holy Spirit, and we yield ourselves to you that there might be movement in our lives and there might be movement in this church as a whole, that we would corporately go somewhere together. We thank you that you have been speaking, we thank you that you have been directing, and we thank you that you have been meeting us as a congregation. We thank you that you have been liberating people in this room from things that they've carried. We thank you that you are uniting this church as a body, not as a bunch of people, but you are uniting this church as a body. And so we open ourselves to you up as members of this body for you to speak and direct so that we might even grow individually and grow closer together as a body. So you may have your way as your kingdom comes in our hearts, minds, in this church and in this city, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Man, what a wonderful time already. What a wonderful time already. I really do get a sense that our church, us as a group of people, uh, we're on the edge of something. We're on the edge of embracing um, an actual journey together in the Lord where, where our church becomes something. Our church becomes um, not just a group of people who gather and kind of do that same thing every week. Uh, so th- sort of that, that, that circular pattern of, oh, yeah, yeah, we get together, we sing, we talk about the Bible. We get together, we sing, we talk about the Bible. And you just kind of go out, and then you come back. And, and there's just kind of this revolving door. Um, I really do get a sense that our Father is bringing us along and starting a journey with us as a group of people and taking us somewhere where we as a group of people become something together that is different and we become something for this city that is tangibly good. Um, And I I believe that's what he's up to. But I think what he's up to today and right now um, is is in a sense to kind of gather us all together and get us moving in the same direction because I think today we need to deal with something that is a common word in Christianity. This is the word faith. Uh, But the way that faith is expressed or the way that we understand what faith actually is uh, is the difference between us just being uh, a church that kind of goes in circles or, as an individual, uh, us being people whose lives just go in circles where we just kind of deal with the same thing over and over and over again and there's never real breakthrough, there's never real growth. It's just the same kind of habits kind of going up and down and up and down and up and down but never really growing anywhere, if that makes sense. And we can do that as a church too. We can just kind of do the same thing day in and day out and we can kind of, well, I hope more people come and sit in the pews, you know what I mean? Like, But that's not a church growing and going somewhere and doing something and becoming something. And so if we don't deal with this concept of faith and we don't begin to walk as as people who know what it looks like to embrace faith and walk by faith and not by sight, then we actually can't do anything of spiritual value. We can just gather together and think through things and reason through things, but we don't actually have direction from the God of heaven through his spirit to actually become the supernatural presence of Jesus on the earth. 
Because that's what the, the church is. That's what the body of Christ is. He is the head and we are the body. And so we are the supernatural presence of Jesus on the earth. But if we do not walk as he walked, and if we do not walk by faith in the way that he walked by faith, then we do not walk as the body of Christ. We walk as a bunch of people who have ascribed to the religion of Christianity and simply what we do is study the Bible and know the Bible. It is not bad to study the Bible and know the Bible. It's absolutely fantastic. But faith is not fundamentally believing that God simply exists somewhere and that we believe he exists out there. The Bible says that the demons in hell believe that and they're terrified of it, right? So it, that's not the same to just, oh, God exists. I have faith. That's my faith. Faith is something that is day in. It is day out. And it's not just day in and day out believing that he's there. It's day in and day out believing that our Father in heaven, if this is a relationship, is communicating to us, and then we are responding with agreement and decisions that come from what we're receiving and moving forward on them, even if we cannot prove what the outcome will be. And so there is a real necessity, I believe, right now for us as a group of people to actually become a body, to become the particular body of Christ. We're not the whole body of Christ. We've become this particular body that's held together and all going in the same direction that we embrace this concept of faith in a really meaningful way. It is perfectly okay for people in this body to be at various levels in their growth and development in the Lord. That is very natural. I hope we always have people who are coming to know the Lord, right, and who are not yet mature in that. Like, great, that is, it should be that way. If it's not that way, I'm going to be upset, and you should be too. But if we do not have at least some kind of general consensus about what the goal is or about what we're up to or about what it looks like to walk with him, if we're all at different places on the map about that, then we are never going to work together as a body because we're always going to be fighting and pulling against each other because you're going to have some people in the congregation walking in a certain way and other people in the congregation being like, oh, I don't know if they should walk that way because it kind of makes me feel nervous and weird and scared, Right? So I don't mean that I want homogeny in this Bible, I'm in this Bible, in this body. I don't want, I don't want everybody to look the same. I actually want a, 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 like a, a lot of difference, diversity. Right? We want that. But there needs to be kind of a general consensus on what it looks like to walk with Jesus and not a bunch of various differences on what it actually looks like to do that. And again, this concept of faith is extremely important in that. So um, if you came for a sermon Last week was a sermon. I preached at you last week. This week I need to teach at you a little bit. I need to go. I need. I need you. To, I need you to follow me in some places. I need to be a little more thorough. Um, I need to go a little bit into history, but I promise I won't go too deep. I promise. Okay. We are going to touch it, and then we're going to move along. But really, the purpose of this is I, I want us to kind of. I want us to kind of to kind of come together and be like, okay, I was out here, but I feel better coming in here. I feel better. Or as I'm doing this, you might be like, ugh, I don't want to be at this church anymore. And I'd be like, that's good. We figured that out early. We figured that out now. That's great. I don't want you to hang around for a long time. You know what I mean? If this isn't the place, I mean, you got other places to visit. We got, I don't know, 10,000 churches inside the city limits. So if this ain't the place, then by all means, begin that journey of finding the right place. Um, because I do believe that what, what we do here and the way that we encounter our Father and the way that we follow Jesus is distinct, right? There are many things that we agree on as churches of Jesus Christ, right? There's, there's the, the core of theology, and we, we agree on those things. But there is a particular way of walking with God that I don't know uh, that uh, is going to be comfortable for everybody. Uh, and so I want to kind of make it clear what, what it looks like for us as a body to walk by faith. Uh, and so there may be some challenging things today, some things I'm going to, I'm going to rub up against some, maybe some preconceived notions a little bit, but hopefully what we're doing is we're coming together. We're coming together as a body. So let's do it this way. There are two places that we can get stuck on our descent into a life of faith. And I'm calling it a descent into a life of faith and not an ascent, because, you know, ascending is, oh, it's heavens. But because a life of faith is about depth and mystery, and so you're descending into a life of faith. 
I do want to say this before I get too deep. I want to let you know where we're going before the very end. I hope by the end of this, I hope by the end of this, if you do not have, I've talked about this twice before, but this will be the last time I think I do it really, and I'm going to do it earnestly. If you do not have a place where you record the things that you're saying to God and that you are writing down the things that he was responding to you with, if you do not have a place where you are doing that, you will most likely not see consistent breakthrough in your life. And so if I could ask anything of you, before this is over, go to Amazon, order a nice one that you want to look at. Don't get one of these, right? You won't keep it. I want you to get something that will last forever. Okay, and then I want you to do, so if, I, if, 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 if on this journey of history and a little theology and some book of Hebrews that we're going to dive into, if by the end of that you're like, God, I have no idea what this guy's talking about, at least grab on to order one of these. Like if you're compelled but confused, which maybe that's where you're going to be, I'm compelled, but I have no idea what you're talking about, but I'm so compelled, then at least you know, go order three of these, right, because you're going to need them. If we're going to walk by faith, you're going to need one of these, Okay. Okay. Yes and amen. Got it. Wonderful. We will do that. As your pastor, we will submit. Um, and I've ordered stock. I bought some stock in Mol- Moleskine. I don't know how to pronounce it. Whatever it is. <laughs> so I'm just hoping that pays out today, too. <laughs> you know, I thought it was Moleskine, but then it looks like Moleskine. Right? Isn't it like Swedish or something? Never mind. I'm taking us too far, Phil. I've got, we've got to get moving. There's two places we can get stuck at, right? Let's jump in at the first place that you can get stuck in on this descent into what I will call real Jesus-like faith. Real, earth-changing, life-changing, home-changing, person-changing, city-changing faith. The first place that you can get stuck at is you can get stuck at salvation, let me tell you what I mean by that. And I want to use Hebrews 6. We're going to be in Hebrews for, for all of these points today. But in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2, it says this. It's interesting, right? It says, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ. Weird. He's calling the doctrine of Christ elementary. Let us, therefore, leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and let's go on to maturity, growth, direction, Maturity, it's not doing the same thing over and over again. It's not the same battles all the time. It's not the same habits. It's it's movement. Uh, uh, Go on to maturity. Not laying again. What's laying again? The foundation of repentance from dead works. So the uh, constantly asking forgiveness for the same thing over and over and over again. How many of you were raised in a church where uh, where you, you... how many of you have been saved more than 10 times? Let's be honest. How many of you been saved more than, I mean, like, I've been saved more than 10 times. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, like, you're, you know, when I was growing up, I'd be in a sermon, I'd be in a church, and, and there's a great sermon, and you know where the practical application was at the end of the sermon? You need to give your life to Jesus. Do you know that you know that you know? And I'm like, well, dang, I know that I know but I don't know that I know that I know. <laughs> I better do this again. <laughs> right? And then youth camp, right? Gosh, how many of you have been saved at youth camp more than seven times, right? For real. So the invitation for us is like, let's get past the foundation, which is the foundation. It's the foundation. Foundations are important. I'm a, uh, foundations are extreme. So when I'm talking about stuck at salvation, I'm not talking about you're stuck at something unimportant. I mean you're trying to build a house and you stopped at the foundation is what I mean. Let's get past the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God and of instructions about washing and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. So let's get past the question of hell. right? Let's get past that. Let's get past the foundations. Keep building this thing so we can live in this house. Not just walk around on a concrete slab and be like, this is great, this is great. Look at this. It's hard and it's flat. And I know I've got it, right? Uh, so we can get stuck at salvation. And I, and I would argue, I do believe the American church in the West is stuck at salvation. I believe that's why most of us have had the experience that we've had over and over and over again. 
think most of us have had the experience of multiple salvations, multiple times at youth camp where we can't get past the thing and we can't get past the thing and then we re recommit ourselves and rededication, rededication, rededication. It's because we're stuck at salvation. And we're grateful that we've got it, uh, but we're stuck at it. And so I, I, this is where I need to touch on history for a minute. Walk with me for just a minute. Uh, the sort of Christianity that's dominated the West for the last hundred years or so it has a very, very strong set of beliefs and a strong set of teachings about how to become a Christian, how to be born again and how to be saved. And secondly, the sort of Christianity that's dominated the West for the last hundred years or so has a very strong set of beliefs and teachings about how to study the Bible and how to understand what the Bible is. And the reason we are very good at understanding the Bible and understanding what the Bible is and why we're very good at understanding what salvation is is because uh, our, our church, when I say our church, I mean the Protestants. You know what Protestants are? Does that, that word make sense? If you're, basically, if you're not Catholic or Greek Orthodox, you're just a Protestant, okay? It's, it's everything that's not Catholic and Orthodox. Um, everything since the, the Reformation with Martin Luther, okay? The Protestant church has been shaped by two conflicts, two conflicts. Most of us, if you didn't know this, you get very scarred or shaped by the conflicts that you grow, go through. But the Protestant church has been shaped by the two major conflicts that it's been in. The first one is this, the battle for salvation. The Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, he was fighting the Catholic church about what it means to be saved. So all of his writings and all the writings that came after him and all the people that taught and all the people that jumped on board and all the people that said, yes, we don't want to go the Catholic way. We don't like what the Catholic Church has done in the, the, the medieval area. This is not a negative sermon about the Catholic Church. Love the Catholics in the town. Love the Reformation that's continuing to go on inside the Catholic Church. Right? That's not what this is about. It's just to explain that the conflict with the Catholic Church in the medieval period that started the Protestant Reformation was all about salvation by faith. And so when we did that and we got lost in that conflict, all of the teaching and the writing and everything that our forefathers in Protestantism wrote about was about that. And then we thought that was the golden era, so that's all we did. For, we just talked about it. It's all we did. We ate it up. We're like, yeah, salvation by faith, yeah. And we, we just geek out on it. They're like, this is the reason Martin Luther, yeah, salvation by faith. And he, yeah, he showed those Catholics, right? And he nailed that thing to the door because he, he's awesome, you know? And we just got, we got geeked out on it. That was the battle that he fought. Therefore, it is the most teaching that we have. Therefore, it is the thing that we value the most. Therefore, it is the thing that we can get stuck on. And then what contributed to this that came about 200 years later was that there was all this theology coming out of Germany that was trying to say that the Bible wasn't God's word and that the Bible wasn't literal and that the Bible wasn't everything that we had thought the Bible was for the 1900 years that preceded it. And so the Protestants went to war against what, what's called German liberalism or, or just the theology that was coming out of Germany at that time. They went to war defending that the Bible is the word of God. And when they went to war defending that the Bible is the word of God, they got so stuck on the Bible being the word of God that they couldn't conceive of the word of God being anything other than what is in the Bible. Did you follow what I said there? We had to defend that the Bible was the word of God. So then we got really scared that there could be anything else outside of the Bible that is the Word of God. What do I mean when I say that? What I mean is, is when that, when that attack was being hit back against German liberalism, the idea that God speaks to you by His Spirit, that He interacts with you directly, that He might interact with me directly about where our church is, that He might interact with you directly about your house and your home, that he might interact with you directly about the state of, of your kids. That he might interact with you directly about what's going on in your, in your workplace. All of that became off limits because that challenges what we're trying to prove about the Bible. Does that make sense? And so the church in the West got stuck. The church in the West got stuck at salvation, sitting in silence. Stuck at salvation, sitting in silence, 
because faith only means that you have had faith in Jesus. So the only thing that you can actually have faith in is your entry into Christianity. So faith stopped at Jesus, and the concept or the idea that you walk by faith, by a consistent relationship with the Spirit of God who is in you, because of what Jesus did, became very scary and became very concerning to the theologians of the time, so we needed to stamp that out because we are concerned that you people might think that you hear something from God that might contradict the Bible, and that makes us very nervous right now. And it makes us very nervous because we don't like what's coming out of Germany right now. Does that make sense? So what became very comfortable and what became very acceptable was a church style and a church emphasis that was on getting you saved and then 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 getting you saved. And you, you, you're yearning inside for something more. You're yearning for more. You're reading the Bible and it's talking about streams of living water coming from you. And it's talking about that take my yoke on you because it's easy and light. And you get these, these, this idea of like rest and freedom and power. And then when he's telling the disciples that you'll do greater works than I did. Or he'll say things like, my sheep hear my voice and they know my voice. And so you, you hear it and you read it and you yearn for more. And then, and then what, you're, what you're fed is get saved. And you're like, well, if I'm yearning for more, it must mean that I'm not saved. So I'll get saved. And so then we got stuck. We got stuck at salvation sitting in silence. Because growth in the Lord is not about repentance from dead works. Entrance into the Lord is about repentance from dead works. Entrance into the Lord. The foundation, right? The foundation is that no matter what I do, my relationship with Jesus will not be changed. So stand on that foundation. Some of us don't have that foundation. No matter what you did yesterday, our Father in Heaven still looks at you with loving kindness. Stand on that foundation. Don't let that go. But don't stop at that foundation. Don't stop at that foundation. So if you stop here, Christianity looks like convincing people through reason that they should follow Jesus because he's a historical figure. Time with God is reduced to gathering more knowledge. It is not about interacting with your father about your life right now. The pain and the obstacles and the sickness in your life, they're God's decision for you, and they're immovable. They're immovable. He decided it. You live with it. Now learn some new lessons. And it looks like a cycle of recommitment. If you've stopped there, if you've had enough faith to receive Jesus, that's awesome. There's no condemnation. There's no condemnation for that. It's beautiful. It is wonderful. Don't hear me minimizing it. I'm not minimizing it. It's a, it's a wonderful and miraculous, it's a miracle to go from death to life. It's a miracle. But your life should be a series of those stories, not a calling back to the one time that it happened. Does that make sense? That's growth, right? That's life. It should be a series of breakthroughs. It should be a series of transformations. It should be a series of stories. So if we can, if we can theoretically get to the place, okay, I do believe, I, okay, you're compelling with your, your, your historical array of knowledge, Terrell. You have, you've wowed us. And, and I believe that he speaks today. There's another place we can get stuck at. Don't get stuck thinking that he speaks today but not to you. That's actually more dangerous now. That stranglehold on God speaking to us as, as his children is kind of going away in the church. We're, we're, we're wading out of it. Um, praise God. It is not as strong as it used to be. 
But what is more pernicious right now, what is more destructive right now, what is choking the life out of the body of Christ right now is actually not that anymore. It is the thinking, and this is where it gets very particular to you. This is where theology doesn't fix it, right? This is where it's not about history and theology or anything. It's about you. Don't get stuck thinking that he speaks today but not to you. What happens for us is that there's this internal disqualification. We internally disqualify ourselves. That he speaks to other people because they're more important and they have it all together and they're more spiritual. Right? You might have some more nuanced and complex uh, reasons why in your own head. But I bet you could boil it down if you got past the complexity. That's where you're going to take it to. Other people are more important, or they're more spiritual, or they're just not as, quite as bad as me, right? Because you don't know what I've done, pastor. You don't know what I've done. You don't know the things I've done. You don't know what I've carried. So there's an internal disqualification that happens. We become too insignificant to God. We're too unworthy before him to actually believe he would make our life meaningful. He'd actually relate to me. He'd actually set me free from things. He'd actually like deal with the stuff that holds me back. He obviously does it for other people, but he doesn't do it for me. So I just, I just want to, let's reason together. Let's reason together. I, I, I just a question. Because because we've been shaped by the Bible, most of you know your Bible, right? Most of you know the stories of your Bible, like Abraham and David and Paul, the guy that wrote the Bible, right? <laughs> you know the stories. So how on earth, how on earth could you be disqualified? Like how on earth could you be disqualified? So if you're not important enough, if there's other people more important than you, let's look at the, the, the people that you know from the Bible who are like the faithful ones, the ones who knew God. They didn't know about God, they knew God. They had stories. Powerfully moved through them, shaped the world through them. The Bible's about them. David was the forgotten, probably illegitimate son. Probably Ill an illegitimate son. Uh, uh, and he was reduced to being a shepherd, which is the lowest thing that you can do, not only in a family, but in a, in a, in a society. So much so that when the prophet Samuel comes to anoint a king in Jesse's family, David doesn't even get invited to the feet. He doesn't get to come inside. And Samuel's like, uh, none of these kids are the one, Jesse. Um... You have any more kids? He's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't you love to be that guy? Oh, yeah, I got this one. He's out. He's in, you know, he's in the flock with the sheep. We hate him. I was going to hide him from you. I'm actually nervous that you're asking about him. And Peter is, the, he, Peter is the rock on which the church was founded, right? St. Peter. He's the, he's the one on whom the church is founded. He is a poor fisherman in the Middle East 2,000 years ago. Untrained, unqualified to, to study under a rabbi, unable to learn like, from the teachers. He is a fisherman. He fishes. That's what he does. And this is the guy that Jesus chose to establish all of the, every, the last 2,000 years, all of the world has been shaped by that, that guy. His influence, his yes, his faith towards Jesus. He didn't even understand what Jesus was doing most of the time that he was around Jesus. He was confused. He had no idea what was going on. But he was, he was just saying yes to him. He just believed him. He followed him. He trusted him. Uh, Jesus himself. Jesus himself. Again, as a poor Middle Eastern man who is the son of a teenage girl of she's nobody i hate to break it to you mary was nobody and when she got pregnant she was exiled from her community because baby girl was not married and that's a no-no and her story about god made me pregnant didn't fly So obviously God's not choosing significant people. 
But maybe you're disqualified because of what you've done. Maybe God won't speak to you because you're a bad person. Maybe God won't speak to you because you won't let go of certain habits. Maybe God won't speak to you because you've done some things in college that you're not proud of. Maybe you've done some things in the last four years you're not proud of. Maybe you did some things last week you're not proud of. And so you're disqualified from hearing him until you walk in holiness. That would make perfect sense if it wasn't for the Bible. Like if it wasn't for the Bible, that'd be great. Because none of you in this room, not, no, like legitimately, none of you in this room are as bad as the heroes of the Bible. None of you are as bad as them. Abraham, the father of faith. Abraham is the father of faith. He slept with his maid and had a child by his maid. And then when he would travel around to different places, he would tell the authorities that his wife was his sister so that they might sleep with her and not kill him. What a guy. <laughs> what a guy. <laughs> He's really taking that like oneness, protector, and marriage thing really seriously, you know? <laughs> David. The, the, root of David's the, the root of David's throne, this is the person to whom God promised that there, there will be someone who sits on your throne for all eternity. Jesus from the line of David. He is the seed of, of Jesus' line. He's awesome. He does awesome things. He does wonderful things. He writes the Psalms. He knows really God. He, know, he knows God extremely well. He also sleeps with women uh, when he sees them bathing on porches, when he has sent his, his people to war, the generals are at war, and he, and he is on his roof watching people bathe. And then since he's king and he can do what he wants, he just, why don't you come over for a whiskey? And we'll Netflix and chill, Bathsheba. Do you know what I'm saying? But that's not, I mean, Right? But you know what he does when he has to cover his tracks? Yeah. He killed her husband. Because she got pregnant. Whoops. Right? She gets pregnant. He needs to hide it. So he brings her husband home. And when he is too good of a guy because his soldiers are fighting, he doesn't think it's right to go in and sleep with his own wife and relax. He refuses to go sleep with his wife. He refuses it because of honoring the soldiers that are fighting for him. He's not even king. He's just a soldier. He's a general. He refuses to sleep with his wife. David can't cover his tracks. So you know what he does? He repents and he pleads before God. No, he doesn't. He sends a letter back in that guy's hand to his commanding officer that says, when he gets back, make sure he goes to where the fighting is the fiercest and make sure he dies. What a guy. What a guy. But he's after God's own heart. Paul, he wrote the New Testament, most of it. He was chasing Christians down and putting them in prison. And he is responsible for the first person to be murdered in the name of Jesus, Stephen. But you're disqualified? Maybe you just believe lies from demons that you're disqualified and you're not actually disqualified. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe there's more demons talking than the Spirit of God. And maybe there's more yes to demons than there is to his Spirit. Maybe you're saying yes to disqualification that's not from the Spirit of God when you could be saying no to that disqualification based on the book that he gave us. Going to war against that garbage. And so don't get stuck. Don't get stuck at salvation. But don't get stuck thinking it's today but not to you. Because it is today and it is to you. God went through a lot of trouble so this spirit could be placed in your heart. So that you could be called a son and a daughter of God. So that you could be his body on the earth. Full of power and life. That you could be an expression of Jesus walking around this earth. Went to a lot of trouble for it. 
So don't be disqualified so easy. Don't be disqualified so easy. Gosh, I even had scripture, but I'm, I'm, right? Hebrews 4. Since we have a great high priest, he's passed through the heavens. Jesus, the son of God. Let's hold fast our confession. Let's hold on to it. Because we don't have a high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weakness. But we do have a high priest who in every respect he's tempted as we are. He knows what it's like. He knows how difficult your life is. He knows how hard it is to work through temptations. He knows how hard it is to break cycles. He knows what it's like to be a human being. But one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet he's without sin. So then, because of that, let's draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we might receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. You know what today is? It's a time of need. I hate to break it to you. You're needy. You're needy. You might be lying to yourself and thinking you're not needy. You need the Spirit of God today to take your life from an okay terrestrial life or a good terrestrial life to a meaningful, spiritual, and eternally impactful one. You need that today. So today is a time of need. You don't need to wait till it's desperation time. You don't need to wait until you're so far in debt up to your eyeballs that you cry out to God. You don't need to wait for that. You don't need to wait to draw near to God. You don't need to wait until your marriage is falling apart. You don't need to wait until your relationship with your kids is destroyed. You don't need to wait until your life is this like mess on the ground. That's not the time of need. They're like, oh, draw near. No, today, today would be that day. Today is the day. So, let's not get stuck there. Let's not get stuck there. So then what do we do, right? What, what does it look like? What's the answer? I'm going to say it. There's two steps to this. There's two ways. And I really want you to follow me. We're going to get to this. This is, this is it. Let's go to Hebrews 11 real quick. Because this is the place where it gets uncomfortable. This is the place where it gets mysterious. This is the place where it gets improvable. This is the place where you have to step out. This is the place where you can't guarantee outcomes. This is the place where it's actually faith. <laughs> this is the place where you're actually embracing faith. Faith is the assurance, this is Hebrews 11.1, 1, it's the assurance of things that have been hoped for. I want you to own that for a minute, but we're going to circle back to it. It's the conviction of things that you have not seen. Down to verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Because whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So here's what I mean by this. Follow me. This is where I want to get kind of practical. When you come into worship, when you hear sermons, more importantly, when you draw near to him, when you take a moment to just, just, just turn towards him, when you take a minute to draw near to him, you're there, like when you take a minute to draw near to him, there is his desire to begin to communicate with you. It is absolutely there. But what happens is if we get past the disqualification of theology and the way we've been raised and what we're comfortable with and what we're not comfortable with, we have to now embrace the actual difficult part is that I have the Spirit of God in me. I've never been trained in what it looks like to relate to a spiritual being that's inside of me. And so I don't really have any foundation on what it's like to hear from God aside from all of my own thoughts and all the conflicting thoughts and everything that's going on. So like, you get lost in the milieu of it, right? And so the first thing that we've got to embrace is that this is a journey of learning. It's not him opening the heavens and speaking and you know for sure that it's him and there's no, I knew it was him. It was an angel. And, and no wings, but for sure it was an angel, and he spoke to me, and he told me this thing, and so now I'm going to hold on to that. That is not what daily life in the Lord is like. So the first step is that you embrace what you think he might be saying to you. <laughs> this is when some people decided... I don't know about that Mosaic Church. I don't know about that. Embrace what you think he might be saying.
not only have we been shaped by German liberalism, not only have we been shaped by Protestant Reformation, we've all been shaped by rationalism, the scientific revolution. We've been shaped by the idea that all questions are answerable and all real things are provable. We've been shaped by materialism, not just the idea that material things give value. That's not materialism. Materialism is the idea that only material things exist. Not only have you not embraced, like, as a society, if we embrace a society that a spirit lives inside of you and is speaking to you, our society has rejected that whole hog. Our society has rejected that anything that's not this isn't real. And then somehow we try to situate the Bible on top of that. <laughs> so the scientific revolution, the enlightenment, materialism, rationalism, the philosophy of skepticism has all made us a group of people that believe that the best thing we can do is be skeptical and not trusting. That you only trust what's provable. And that if I'm, if I'm sensing it inside, that it really shouldn't be trusted because logic is actually more trustworthy than emotion. My mind is more trustworthy than my heart? Hmm. It's weird that the Bible says that I've stored your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's weird that the new covenant is that I'm going to write my law on your heart. It doesn't seem to write on your mind. I mean, <laughs> sometimes I find the most deceived people are the most logical people. They just have the smarts to be so embedded in their deception, they're never coming out of it. At least like our, these heart-led people and these emotional people, at least they're dumb enough to believe God. <laughs> at least Peter was dumb enough to believe Jesus. And Paul was dumb enough to believe Jesus. And the disciples were dumb enough to believe Jesus. So when I say we have to embrace what we think he might be saying, what I mean is us as a generation, us as a society, we've not been primed for what it looks like to hear from God. And we've also been told most of our lives that it's not okay. So it's a difficult thing to break out of. And it's definitely difficult inside of a, uh, an environment like East Texas where what I'm saying is borderline heresy. <laughs> that God would speak to you. That he would love you. That he cares about your life. That he wants to communicate to you. That he wants to set you free from habitual sin. That he wants to give you purpose and meaning. That he cares about all aspects of everything that you do. And that he wants to elevate you from the place that you are. That your life doesn't have to be a revolving door of the same habits. That it can be a progression towards holiness and glory. That the Bible might be true that it's glory to glory. I think it's more than history that's trying to bind the church into that way of thinking. You know what I mean? Maybe there's something spiritual to it. But, all that to say... Embrace what you think he might be saying to you. Let me give you just a real quick, um, a real quick walk through this. I'm going to do this pretty quickly because I do want some time to worship here. Every morning I get up and I go to the Psalms and I read a bit of the Psalms. And if anything resonates in the Psalms, I write it down, just a line or two that resonates. Then I keep reading and if something else resonates, I write it down. And then after I've written a couple down, I'll go back. And I'll fill in, I'll leave gaps, and I'll start talking to God about what resonated. I stop trying to get understanding, and I start trying to, I start trying to get revelation. I stop the understanding, and I move towards revelation. And I embrace 
what I think he might be saying to me. And I write it down. If I'm at a 40%, you know what I do? I write it down. If I'm at an 80%, I think this God, I write it down. If I'm at like a 25%, you know what I do? I write it down. And I engage with him. And then I engage with my community about it. I engage with my church about it. I engage with my friends about it. I talk to them about it. I engage the scriptures about it. Is what I'm talking about completely contrary to the scriptures? Well, if it isn't, I'm going to cross that off. But I start by embracing what I think he might be saying because I do not come from an environment where this was okay. But I do study a Bible where this is fundamental. So what a journey we have in front of us of doing that. So I embrace what I think he might be saying to me and then I pursue clarity on it. The second step to that is this. I embrace what I think he might be saying to me and then you steward it for the rest of your life. That's why it's got to go in here. When I say you steward it, what I mean is you have to go back to it over and over and over again. Okay, let me make something clear. This is not authoritative in the sense that we talk about the Bible. It's not authoritative in the same way. But it is as important to me as the Bible is. Do you know why? That Bible was written to all of us. This was written to me. That Bible was God's word to all of us. But what I have in here is God's words to me. So I can open this up to things that he told me five years ago. And it, and it anchors me and it settles me and it draws me in to what he's up to in my life. Right? Of course if it contradicts what scripture is saying it's going away. Yeah, it's a given. Man, yeah, of course. So it's not as authoritative because this isn't written to you. So it's not, it's not broadly applicable. But it's specifically applicable. But the reality is, is that you, if you do not have a place where you can go back to what God said five years ago, four years ago, three years ago, two months ago, one month ago, a couple days ago, and begin to string that together and begin to get rid of the chafe that's like, yeah, 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 okay, I see what's going on. It's the history of the thing that helps me determine what's going on, right? But then I'm returning to it and I'm stringing this thing together and I'm seeing what he's up to. And so then I can start to see forward for what he's doing. I can see his faithfulness, and then I can stand on his words, right? Like, like, so, like, I need, I need it. Four days ago, he said, enjoy this journey. I will provide. Do not let stress of decisions or the fear of lack rob my spirit from you. It will spoil your inheritance, and it will sully your anointing and your purpose. Yesterday, I got stressed that there wasn't going to be enough. And you know what I would have done five years ago? I would have been like, uh, you know what I'm saying? You know what I do nowadays? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, you told me something already. I will do that. Thank you, Father. I'm not going to let the stress of a decision turn that over to you. I'm not going to let the fear of lack rob what you're doing inside of me. Amen to that. Thank you, God. If God spoke it, it's important. Okay? If God spoke it, it's important. If you don't steward what he communicates to you, if you don't steward what he communicates to you, if you stop before you steward it, your relationship and your growth are going to be ecstatic but volatile. There's going to be these moments when you believe so strongly and you'll feel like breakthrough and miracles are imminent. And then you'll descend into these volatile periods where he is not near and you're overcome by things that you thought you had freedom from because the words that he was speaking into your life to anchor you and stabilize you and give you confidence in the obstacles you forgot about. You receive the encouragement in the moment, but you didn't receive the stability for a lifetime. And so what you're going to find is that if you don't have a habit of this, it is not going to be a life of faith. You can get encouraged by moments, but you need, you need your history in the Lord established. Your grandkids need to see what God told you. You know what I'm saying? You have a legacy that needs to see what God told you. It has to be established or else you will go in circles. You'll go in circles. I 
I do want to worship. Let's, let's, let's stand. Thank you for the life of faith, God. Thank you for that. Thank you for it. Would you elevate faith in this room? And would you unite our hearts together in a journey of believing what you say and then returning to it over and over and over again? We trust you, Father. And so would you speak to us even now as you want to communicate things to us that you have for us, directions that you have for and guidance to give to us. And so would you speak and would you move and would you be here among us in Jesus' name?